Thank you Creative Mornings and thank you Cam for having me. This is a, truly a great honor to be in my hometown, Raleigh. I wasn't born and raised here, but this is definitely my home. And it's a, a new experience for me to be in front of peers. <laughs> Normally I do this in front of a whole bunch of strangers. So some of you are familiar faces, which is uh, very uh, warm hearting to me. Before we get to, into this explanation, I want to tell you that I was actually born to fail. And I was born to fail over and over again. We all were. We're structured that way. Without failure, we don't have the mental fortitude developed, the tenacity that we find in life, and the desire to want more, and the building of character to succeed. It's through failures, and I say that plurally, it's through failures and failures and failures that we finally succeed in something that we're truly passionate about. And if we weren't truly passionate about it, they we wouldn't care whether we failed or not. So not only was I designed to fail, but we all were designed to fail. And through that failure, we really find the true happiness of our lives and the meaning of why we're here and self-discovery of what we're truly capable of. Our passions, our desires, and our potential. You'll have to excuse me if I get a little emotional because this is, this is my life story. And it's incredible to reflect on my personal journey and to hear your personal journeys as well. So when I say that I was born into failure, I was a product of my environment. I was born into a, a low, very low income family. We actually had a wood stove at one point. My brother slept in the hallway. I shared a bedroom, a bed, bed, not just bedroom, but a bed with my sister. And um, our, our source of heat was wood. <laughs> so through that, we learned how to be a very close family. And I also started to believe that I wasn't as worthy as some of the other peers that I had in school. So through this, I went through school, and I had a few traumatic episodes of events in my life. One, a major car accident when I was 13. So it, I used that experience to allow myself to venture off into a very destructive lifestyle. Around nine years old, I started smoking because both of my parents smoked, so that's what I saw and that's what I was exposed to. Around the same time, I started drinking and doing various drugs. And I continued that until that traumatic episode when I was 13, that car rack. And I allowed that to take hold of my life. I allowed that fear to hold on and grip me. So then I continued this very destructive lifestyle into my early adolescence. I did whatever was put in front of me. I tried anything and everything. And I was a product of my environment that I put myself in. Through school, I was actually pretty smart. I was in advanced classes until I was in late middle school, early high school. And these traumatic events allowed me to hold on to a fear that prevented me from trying something new. So I had two years of athletics in middle school and then I wasn't an athlete until my mid-twenties. But those two years of athletics, I really enjoyed it and it really helped my self-esteem. When this traumatic event, this car accident happened, I allowed it to, to grip my life and to control my decisions. Therefore, when I relocated schools after this accident, I was too fearful of failure to try out for the volleyball team, to try out for the cheerleading team, to try out for the track team. I allowed that fear to grip me so tightly 
that failure wasn't going to be in my life because I wasn't willing to try something new. Most of the time when you ask somebody what's their biggest fear, nine out of ten times it's failure. And then you ask them a little bit further, what is it that you're scared of failing of? And then they kind of are deer in headlights. Well, what do you mean? Well, what are you scared of failing of? My fear wasn't of being rejected from the volleyball team. My fear wasn't of being rejected from the other sports that I was interested in. My fear came from not acceptance. My fear came from being rejected and then having less self-worth than I already had. I allowed that fear of failure to control me. And so I decided that I wasn't going to attempt anything. I wasn't going to be in any extracurricular activities. I wasn't going to go out and talk to that cute guy that I thought was interesting. I wasn't going to go out and try to do well on a test. So I just did enough to get by. My fourth grade teacher called me an underachiever. I really want to talk to her today. <laughs> <laughs> But instead of pushing me into the direction of trying and being uncomfortable with trying something new and embracing that potential failure, I ran the opposite way. And nobody was there to direct me otherwise. So instead of reaching out, I held within and I just didn't try anything. And this continued all through my life. So I barely graduated high school because I did enough to pass because I didn't want to try. And if I tried to do well on the test and I didn't do as well as I wanted to and I didn't meet my own expectations because we can be very harsh on ourselves. If I didn't meet my own expectations, then I had failed twice. And then my self-worth started to diminish. And then I would be more destructive and then I would have an excuse and I would be angry not at them, but at myself. So I was persuaded by my mother, ironically, <laughs> to take this job in Iraq. And it was, I harassed the company until they hired me. I can be very persistent when I want to be. I harassed the company until they hired me, and they finally hired me as a laundry attendant. And I went overseas, and I only went overseas because it was an open-ended contract. My mother was like, Christmas, if you go, and you don't like what you're doing, AKA if you feel like you're failing, then you can go home. You can return back to your life. Leave. So the, it, was a, it had a net, right? A safety net for me to be able to fall into. If I go and I don't like it, or if I don't succeed, or if I don't feel comfortable, then I can just go ha back to my lifestyle before, right? I had a pretty large life-changing moment in Iraq. Like I said, when I was around nine, I started drinking and, doing, and smoking consistently uh, cigarettes and then doing various drugs a little bit later on. And I was still living that lifestyle up until I went to Iraq. And when I went to Iraq, I was still smoking and drinking. So this was when there was still a lot less law that there is now, or at least was. I got into Iraq. I'm on the bus to go from the airport to the international zone, to my camp. And it's an armored bus, and I'm wearing this flak jacket, and I'm wearing this helmet, and I'm sitting there on the bus, and we were sitting there waiting for two hours. <laughs> and I finally get up and I ask the bus driver, I'm like, hey, can I, can I get off the bus and smoke? And he was like, really? I was like, what are we waiting for? And he was like, there's an IED in the road. And I was like, oh, no idea what an IED was. <laughs> Improvised explosive device, also known as a road bomb. So I was like, okay, so I sat back down. And here I am in the middle of a war zone, wanting to get off the bus, an armored bus with all my um, protective gear, to go smoke a cigarette. So we get into country, finally, a couple hours later, they clear the IED, and I get into country. And I'm actually, my mother had had a small trailer there, so it's one of the few places in the world that you aspire to live in a trailer. And she had a small trailer probably the size of your bathroom in your apartment. And I'm sleeping and I hear, you get familiar with noises in your house, right? So I hear this unfamiliar noise and then I hear a whistle and I'm like, this is not right. And before I can finish that thought, there's a boom and a shake of the trailer. 
I leaped across the room and I collected myself and we had incoming. That was the, a moment for me that I had clarity where I realized that in that moment I was stacking the cards against myself and I was indirectly and subconsciously trying to kill myself. I was still smoking cigarettes regularly. I was still smoking in a war zone. And then I put myself in an, in an active war zone where it was hot as could be in 2004. And I was still getting drunk in the war zone. And then waking up to incoming, I realized at that time that if something actually happened, I was gonna be left. The military was not gonna carry me and I definitely couldn't run to keep up. It was, a, it was a pivotal moment. Most people don't have that aha moment like I had. But that moment was enough for me to realize that I didn't necessarily feel the value of me having life, but I didn't want to die. I wasn't ready. So that was the first time that I decided to make a good decision for myself. That I decided that I was attempting to put myself out there where failure was a possibility and I was gonna quit smoking. And I was gonna quit smoking cold turkey. So I warned everybody, because <laughs> you have to, okay? When you're an addict, you have to like basically give out I'm sorry cards beforehand. <laughs> put, the, put the deposits into the bank, I'm sorry, but this is gonna happen. And I ate candy like a crack addict. <laughs> And I quit smoking cold turkey, and I will tell you that I relapsed a few times, so I did fail a few times. But I kept trying. And I knew that that was something that I wanted enough to accept failure as long as I got back on my feet and I tried again. That was the first time that I allowed failure to come into my life and to be able to be okay with failing and to be willing to push past that failure. I quit smoking and I, over a series of months, I later decided to run 20 minute, a, a mile, right? That was, I still vouch that that was probably the worst and best decision of my life. I was stupid enough to recruit a friend for accountability. I thought he was gonna run it with me, but he didn't. He just stood there to make sure I ran it. I was on a treadmill. <laughs> it was the longest mile of my life and it was the hardest mile of my life and like 200 meters in, I wanted to quit, and he was like, nope. And I was on a treadmill, so all you had to do was pick up your feet. <laughs> and it was going a little bit faster than what I could have walked it in. But for almost a decade, I had been destroying my body, emotionally, physically, mentally. And so this was, this was huge for me. It took me a week to recover, and ironically, I said, fitness is not for me. Quitting smoking is enough. <laughs> About a year later, out of pure boredom and curiosity, I, uh, I started going to the gym and I found the elliptical. Yeah, I was really good at the elliptical. And I found something that I was good at for a little while. And through that, that venture of curiosity and open willingness to fail, I discovered CrossFit, which changed my life. I watched the video, the girls were doing these crazy things, lifting this heavy weight, and I had never seen anything like it. I had no idea what they were doing. And the girl cries at the end, and I was like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I was, I didn't know what it was, and I started doing my own variation for quite some time until I found these guys in Baghdad that adopted me because they were also fellow CrossFitters. And these guys truly, truly tried to break me. And they accepted me, and they will tell you a story about this, that they allowed me to come work out with them just because they were curious about the threshold of pain that I was willing to tolerate. And they literally tried to break me. They were like, she's not gonna last a week. And I was like that little puppy dog that kept coming back every single day. These guys taught me the integrity of finishing something and being relentless with what you want. I would come to work out with them and they would say, Christmas, we're gonna do this great workout. And I was terrified. And during that time, they didn't modify it for a smaller person or a female. And trust me, a push-up was a challenge. And these guys were from special forces. <laughs> it was an odd match at best. So I'm hanging out with these guys and they were like, Christmas, we're gonna do this workout. And I was like, great, what's mine? And they were like, no, you do the same thing as us. And I was like, okay, this is what I asked for. So what would take them 20 minutes took me 45. But the difference between them doing their workout and me doing mine is that when they were finished with theirs, 
they stood beside me and they cheered me on and they made sure that I did every single repetition and they no repped me. They said didn't count if it wasn't to their, to their satisfaction. And they made me understand the importance of even if it doesn't count, that repetition doesn't count. You fail in that push-up. You fail in that box jump. You fail in that movement. You fail in that attempt. You fail at business. I've done that a lot. Uh, you fail at, at trying to talk to somebody. You fail at anything. You get up and you try again. And you don't stop until you have accomplished your goal. And then that's building on to the next goal. And these guys in Iraq, these special forces, that intended to physically break me actually mentally molded my, my mental fortitude. And I'm forever grateful. This is, uh, did I press the button? Okay. This is me in a helicopter. It was actually so active for a while that we weren't allowed to take convoys anymore, military escorted convoys. We actually had to take a helicopter from the airport to our FOB. Um, this is in Mosul in late 2004 when all the insurgents went from Baghdad up to Mosul, and that's when I got promoted and went to Mosul. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, you can see my little arms. <laughs> this is when I discovered the elliptical. <laughs> um, just to give you a little story, this is a, a family that I used to have chai tea with once a week. They actually lived inside the Baghdad International Zone. Uh, Baghdad International Zone was the only military base that had local Iraqis living on the military base with us among the military and contractors. Fun little, this is about three years ago. Um, weighted push-ups. You know, when you get really good at push-ups, you have to find a way to push that threshold and you will fail at these multiple times. So through <clears throat> Through multiple attempts, I've found that failure is not anything that we should be scared of. I actually welcome failure, because it means that one, I'm trying, and two, I need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what went wrong so I can make it better and make it right next time. All successful people have failed multiple, multiple, hundreds, thousands, millions of times before they hit that one successful moment. So what I talk to my athletes about, because I, I own uh, CrossFit Invoke, and, I, and I'm truly, truly proud of all of my athletes. What I talk to my athletes about is successful failure. And failure, by definition, is lack of success. But in my opinion, if you're trying to reach that goal, you're, you're gaining ground. You're building on your platform. You're creating a better founder, foundation and you're building that, more, uh, that mental fortitude. It's challenging, it's hard, it doesn't feel good, but it's rewarding. And anything rewarding in life is worth fighting for. So I talk about successful failure, which is if you fail at something and you truly attempted it, it's still a success. You're just gonna have to do it a few more times before you get to it. <laughs> It also makes that success meaningful. And like I said earlier, it builds character. It builds our understanding of who we are and who we want to be and what's worth that effort in our lives. I love this quote, um, this saying, because it's something that I have truly embraced in my life along with failure and lots of failure, but truly embraced in my life is to be relentless with your dreams even if you're the only one that believes in them. And I tell my athletes and my family and my friends to give yourself the opportunity to amaze yourself. Thank you for listening today. I think this is a, actually this is a great question. He was asking about how did the pit crew experience come about and uh, how that was like. I actually got called from a friend on a whim to come play NASCAR, and I assumed I was going to be driving. And so I was like, yeah, I like to lift things and go fast. Uh, so I went out to Charlotte for a day, 
And when I got there, I realized that there was a pit crew challenge going on and that we were going to be changing tires, jacking the car up and, and hanging tires. And I was like, not, not going to be fun. <laughs> I've never changed a tire in my life. Why do I want to do one today? And then I found out that they have this air gun. <laughs> And they do it really fast, because I didn't know anything about pit crews at the time, even though my family was totally into racing. And uh, we, we did a little CrossFit style, so we went head to head with each other. I beat the boys on changing tires and hitting lug nuts, actually, specifically. I still have that credence. Um, and, and discovered that I was, I was good at it. But what I love about training and pit crewing specifically, because I can literally talk about failure all day, that was like the very abridged version of what my perception of failure is, is that my pit crew coach, when I started learning, there is 99.9% .9 of failure in pit crewing during practices, and it's, you have to, it's like anybody golf, it's like that one, one stroke that you're just like, that was it. And then that's kind of like lifting and, and hitting lug nuts. Once you hit that stride, you're like, that was so easy. Let me do it again a million times. But my coach advocated that in pit crewing, one-tenth of a second will cost you the race, will cost you your job, and will cost you a career in pit crewing. So he said, if you fail, fail quickly, move on. And I love that because I apply that to everything in life. Is if I feel like I've failed something and there's no redos, take a lesson and move on. Yeah, but that was a, a great experience of my life. I loved it. I actually love changing tires. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> so whenever, it depends on the situation a lot of the time. So I'll talk about business failure a little bit. Business failure one, you have to, I'm, I'm very conservative with I, the way that I look at things financially, but I'm also very, very liberal in the risks that I'm willing to take. So as long as I'm walking away with an experience of this didn't work, but why didn't it work? Let's look at where it went wrong and let's look at where it went right. So just because this experience or this attempt was, complete, was a, a failure, it doesn't mean that it was a complete failure. And so I look at Maybe, maybe this attempt, you know, this portion of what went wrong worked really well, but coupling it up with this other portion of that um, effort is what made it fail. So I'll go back and recreate or just revamp what um, went right, and it allows me to see more perspective and bigger picture. So I, I'm looking at, whenever I look at one thing, I look at how it will trickle down and affect the larger picture of what my project is. And a lot of the times I actually work backwards. So I look at the bigger picture and then I say, how do I get to here? And I'll walk it backwards. Is there a difference between failure and something not working out? Yes. I think there, there is a, a difference in failure and, and something not working out. I've had things not work out where I have absolutely given my whole heart into and over and over and over and for years I swam upstream and you have to be able to honestly reflect upon your life, your responsibilities, your passion and what you want to get out of that success goal in order to be able to know whether it's something that you want to continue to pursue. And I've, um, you know, I retired out of pit crewing, not because I didn't love it or not because I was not the best in my, my game, but because I looked at my life and, and I looked at the bigger picture and I was, some people say, will say and can argue that I was not successful in pit crewing because I did not continue an entire season on tire changing in that position. But for me, it was successful because I went with the intention of seeing what it could become and I feel like I lived that to the fullest um, and so I feel like it had ran its course for what I was looking for so although some other most people in the NASCAR industry may think that I was a failure but here I believe that I was actually very successful to get to where I was and I felt comfortable walking away from that position because 
the bigger picture was that it was no longer beneficial in a positive way in my life. Does that make sense? Cool. So you have to look and and you shouldn't allow yourself to deteriorate or to sacrifice more than what you should out of your life just to prove a point that you can be successful in something. And uh, that's what I really had to look at at that time in my life. And I'm, I'm still pleased with my decision. And I love, love changing tires. <laughs> um, but I also love owning my business, being a competitive weightlifting and CrossFit athlete, and being able to be here doing things like this as well. So um, I took the positives from that experience and applied them elsewhere. So there is a difference between failure and, and just walking, you know, be, knowing when to call, call it a day. I love that. Am I com more comfortable because I embrace failure with uncertainty? Nope. <laughs> not at all. It, I, I, you know, <laughs> not at all. But only when I, I only pursue something when I can see the bigger picture and I don't have to have a perfect plan in place. It's not realistic. And whatever plan you have in place will absolutely change day one. So, you know, not having that executed perfect plan, uh, having a plan is important. But being able to be fluid within that plan is equally important. Um, but it, it gives me anxiety if I'm just kind of like go with the flow versus seeing the bigger picture and knowing that there's going to be unknowns and being okay with being able to address them at the time. Okay. So I think the, I think the question is, is how have I dealt with people that have dictated to me what they will expect my life to be like, specifically on aesthetics and my goals? I like this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is gonna sound a little bit rude, but I don't believe them. <laughs> I don't believe that there, you know, this is an outsider looking into my life, and if I took into true consideration and applied their opinion on my life every single time, I would still not be an athlete. I would not have any tattoos. I would probably have multicolored, you know, like there's, there's so many dictations that people say you shouldn't lift because you'll get big. I'm not worried about getting big. I want my body, as I was talking to Lisa earlier, right? I was talking to Lisa earlier. I want my body to perform at the optimal that I know it can. And that, for me, is an accomplishment. The byproduct is aesthetics. And for me, opening a facility was a great way for me to be able to teach what I know to people that want to better their lives. So when somebody comes at me and they're saying, don't get too big, I kind of laugh. They say, don't get too small. I kind of laugh. They were like, don't take on another project. I really laugh. <laughs> and it's not their decision to make. And so I just know that the people that are closest to me will have my best interest at heart and will voice if they have a concern on my lifestyle at the time. Um, and I will listen. But again, I see the bigger picture. And a lot of the times people coming in and peeping into your life see that teeny little, tiny little molecule of what makes up the rest of your life. And, um, you know, it, I've learned to not accept other people's dictations and listen to my own intuition, which has brought me here today. My heroes, you know, I, I grew up in a time where the supermodels were the heroes, you know, Kate Moss, so we didn't have any like super athletic heroes. But I'll tell you in all honesty, um, the women in my family are pretty, you know, and I could go into a separation of my grandmother, my granny, and then my mother. They are all fiery and polite and just incredible, incredible women. And I've been very blessed and fortunate to be able to be exposed to that type of personality and character. And then the last book I read, um, I can't remember the title of it. You guys are going to love this. 
I actually have um, 50 cents book <laughs> on my bed stand. <laughs> I love him. Uh, yeah, he's fantastic. He came from like a super thug life and then like he was like super gangster and then he like made it transformation and like now he's this, you know, like this great upstanding citizen and he loves NASCAR. I met him at the Daytona 500. So I'm a big fan of 50 Cent. Um, <laughs> I'm really a thug, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys.